Welcome to a brand new episode of Sequel Rights, the podcast where we take a look at the franchises that make you go, they made how many of those? And we give each and every sequel a fair trial. My name is Justin Camps and I'm here with Elizabeth Helley and Tyler Hymanson. And we're here talking about the wild fourth sequel, uh, Phantasm for Oblivion. Woo! Yeah, and Oblivion <laughs> has the letters I and V in it. Things Get are it? getting yes. weird, you guys. And we are in numerals. We, things are starting to get real confusing. So we had to bring in a, a, a ringer to help us discuss this. Elis, we have a special guest today, don't we? Yes. Uh, we are very lucky to have the amazing filmmaker, director, writer, Matt Beeler with us. And he made a really awesome short film called Visible that was, uh, in full disclosure, produced by the company that I work for, 20th Digital Studio, way before I got there. But anyways, welcome, Matt. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself in the short? Um, yeah, I, um, direct some things from time to time, commercials, short films, um, whatever kind of comes to the head and feels like, you know, want to put a camera in front of, um, visible was a short that, yeah, we did with, um, with, uh, Fox before it was Fox Disney. I think it was uh, 14 months ago. We shot it, uh, pre COVID. And, um, yeah, it was, a it was a two minute idea that, um, I don't know, I was just kind of investigating some themes that's oddly similar to the phantasm of just dealing with grief and loss. And, um, and yeah, four movies of that have kind of shined a light on this two minute short that I did that, uh, maybe me and Don were, um, trying to figure out the same things in our life. Um, but for this one, yeah, it was, uh, it starts with a, it starts with a girl, uh, on a basketball court and a ball rolls out and uh, kind of takes on a life of its own from there. And hopefully it gives people something to think about and talk about, if not just be entertained uh, for two minutes. So yeah, visible. The, sh- the short is really great, man. I, uh, yeah. I am in awe of the amount of like atmosphere and like interesting ideas you can cram into like just two minutes. It's such a short amount of time and there's lots of cool ideas and stuff going on in that, in that short. I like it a lot. Thanks, dude. And yeah, it was it was a fun one to put together. Um, you know, we shot it all in one night. Um, it felt very much like, you know, as indie as you can kind of be, you know, um, with friends, <laughs> some old friends and some new friends. And uh, I guess all roads do lead to um, to Phantasm because, you know, that felt like the way this journey started <laughs> with friends in the weekend and him shooting these yeah. films and coming, you know, to Oblivion and four and knowing that that same kind of energy went into this fourth version, you know, like the low budget and, and pulling some, you know, not just low budget. Like this movie was made for $650,000 yeah. <laughs> yeah. and literally taking footage from the first film yeah. and making it work. And that was a lot of, you know, kind of what we were doing that night in, uh, in downtown. And uh, yeah, it was super, super fun. And um, you know, I, I shoot a lot of commercials, um, for the most part is primarily what, um, what I work with, but, um, do invisible was, uh, was definitely the highlight of last year because I don't know, it just brought all that energy back that, um, you know, uh, as an independent filmmaker, um, you know, back in the day, just hanging out with friends and trying to make stuff, um, all those juices started flowing again and I'm super, super proud of it. So, yeah. So yeah, definitely check it out. It's on Hulu as we speak. You can check it out. Uh, and, and if you don't pay for Hulu, you can check it out on Hulu's YouTube page in front Ooh. of the paywall. Hot That's right. Tip. It's actually available as part of. <laughs> Huluween. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, before we get into Phantasm Oblivion proper, uh, Elis, where can people reach out to us? Yeah, uh, we're coming up towards the end here. So definitely let us know where you think we should go next. Email us at sequelrights at gmail.com with suggestions for future franchises and find us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Sequel Rights. And please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find our podcast. It's really the easiest and best thing you can do for us. Give us as many stars as there are Phantasm movies, which is five. <laughs> All right. Well, as we've been having over these last few weeks, we're joined by another very special guest, definition guy with a brand new definition of phantasm. Phantasm, the delusion of a disordered mind, a 
phantom, a spirit, a terrifying motion picture experience. For 20 years, the secret of the spheres has remained a mystery. Now, two innocent people are about to confront the ultimate evil. The final game. I'll begin. Uh, if you guys didn't hear that, now the official definition of Phantasm includes a terrifying movie experience. I think it's in the, di- the dictionary if you look it up. Yeah, <laughs> That's just factual. I mean, really. Uh, and this movie takes up where, where all the other ones in the series left off. They pick up exactly where they left you. I yeah. am. Well, first, let's. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I am just I was gonna fascinated say... by uh, the way these movies start. It's just like, what is going to be totally deleted out of the last movie? <laughs> how, it's gonna, how are they going to continue? This? I predicted it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I said, we will never see Timmy again. And. <laughs> We did not. It's like he doesn't uh, even exist. But first, <laughs> Matt, tell us about your history with the Phantasm series. Had you seen any of these before? I uh, I had not. They had been on the list, but I've rocked through four of them in the past, I guess, two weeks. Oh, that is so nice of you and to do for I'm, us. <laughs> I'm slowly trying to quaff my hair into Mike's. Oh. <laughs> I feel like his hair was solid for 19 years like really between was. the first one coming now. And obviously, I mean, I don't know what happened in two. Obviously, there was a little bit of a recast, but, um, but his hair was looking phenomenal in four. It was good. There was almost like a little like David Hasselhoff, Knight Rider. Oh, yeah. Years. So I listened to more of uh, Don's uh, audiobook, uh, True Indie, and he talked about the casting snafu in two, where basically Universal was going to give the money for it, but they wanted a working actor, and the actor who plays Mike hadn't worked in a few years. Yeah. And so they made him read for it, but it actually didn't help. But so they ended up casting that person who he thought, like, he always felt terrible about it. But one of the people that he turned down was, in fact, Brad Pitt. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Instead, and was, he went to uh, what was that movie that we just watched? Cutting class. Cutting class. Yeah. Cutting yeah. class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was it was James Legros, right? Who was in Point Break and Living in a yep. Yeah. Which absolutely he, he was fine. He just yeah, wasn't he was the fine. same guy. Yeah. At yeah. all. There's there's something about the it's something about the way Mike and Reggie look into each other's eyes that. I'm <laughs> always, it really always. is. I mean, they like because like, Mike started you know when he was a kid in these movies and and. Now I'm uh, now I'm overthinking how to say his name after being corrected. Don Coscarelli. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> got it. Got it. Don Coscarelli, you know, he was 20 when they started making these movies. So that just that camaraderie of of what Matt was saying earlier of just going out with a camera and trying to get away with something with your friends, like to, to try to make something cool is is just that such a palpable energy with these movies. Mm-hmm. Which I was going to ask, like, as far as Phantasm goes, I was just thinking about that type of energy, you know, like Blair mm-hmm. Witch Project, Swingers. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a laundry list of movies that that have that sort of energy from the jump. I feel like Phantasm is in that pantheon, and I don't feel like it's talked about enough, maybe, as being one of those kind of rare... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I think it's one of those movies that, like, a lot of people. I think we talked about this in the first episode, but a lot of people slept on it when it first came out, and then a lot of things imitated it, or a lot of things. It was one of those like deep impact Armageddon situations, but (laughs) over a few more years, where a lot of the ideas that explored actually showed up in other horror movies. But it came first, Mm and for a lot of these things, and it doesn't get enough credit for kind of having that truly indie energy that obviously a lot of people saw and channeled into movies that had higher popularity. Um, And Tyler, you articulated this on when you guys did the first one, but the the craft too from Costco, like for being 22 years old at the time and going out on the weekends with his friends and making something like the filmmaking is strong. It's mind blowing. Yeah. it's, 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 And it's like, and he's pulling from like, like Dario Argento and guys that are just like, you know, having geeked out on Suspiria and Deep Red and and, uh-huh. and a handful of others, like it's all there from the score to 
uh, the aesthetic to everything that he's doing. And, and at age 22, I was trying to think about, I was, I think I was still trying to figure out how to turn on a film camera. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, he was killing it. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and like, and cutting that, you know, I mean, most of that movie, he cut himself on a movieola. Like it's yeah. insane. Yeah. It's really amazing. And that's what I love diving into for, because there's a little bit more of that energy. You guys more know probably uh, more than I do, but it felt like two and three, you can feel the studio notes or at least yep. with you, definitely. Two for sure. Yep. Um, and because they're relentless in pacing and it's just like one set piece to the next to the next. But with this one, it felt like he got to take beats to for character stuff that mm -hmm. maybe, you know, I think we were all kind of hoping to find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tall man aka was it jebediah morningside yeah, right? yeah. Uh, <laughs> jebediah uh, springfield yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i that's why i kind of i kind of love this one but just because mm -hmm. it felt like a tortured filmmaker got to close you know we got to write the last chapter of his book in a way i know there's absolutely movie, but not to go not to geek out of it too much but it i don't know I, I, I responded to this one maybe close to as much as I responded to the first one, just in that kind of way. Yeah. Well, the, the insight into that is that, yeah, like the second one for Universal, they gave him $3 million and it had a lot more dream sequences. It had a lot more things in it. And then after the first screening, they said, this has to, everyone needs, the audience needs to know exactly what's happening in every scene and they can't be asking questions. And he was like, that's why you have that terrible voiceover at the beginning of two where she's just like, he was a grave robber from another dimension. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's what he is. But like, you're, yeah. you're never supposed, we went, left that open for the audience to call that out. And then the uh, third one, even though it was supposed to be a uh, theatrical release and ended up being a uh, directive video, uh, it was it had a twenty five two point five million dollar budget that Universal also fronted and had a lot more control over it. This one came about when nobody else was interested in it. And MGM was basically closing down their uh, color lab. And so they called him and they said, hey, we found we have all these phantasm reels that, that are still here. Like, guys, we're closing all about the warehouse, everything like let's let's. You, you can, they're yours. Come pick them up if you want. And he went through them and he was like, well, I can't get fundraising for, for Phantasm 1999, which was this Roger Avery scripted crazy yeah. big budget thing that involved the Mormon mausoleum underneath Salt Lake and all this other crazy stuff that was that sounded insane. Uh, but he's like, but if I can take these shots that we shot for the first movie and I have half this movie shot, then I'm going to I can have the freedom to kind of do whatever else we need to do to build around these scenes. And that's how this movie came about. And it's just so crazy how it feels reminiscent of the tone of like that dreamlike state. I saw somebody call it uh, the plotting narcoleptic. <laughs> Where it feels like that you're nodding off and you're waking up mid some other scene. You're yeah. just like, oh, no, like what's what's happening? And I think somebody was trying to be snide in like an Internet comment. And I'm like, no, that's how you describe that feeling. I think that's actually amazing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was uh, I'm glad to hear, Matt, that you uh, had watched some of the other movies because I was watching this one and imagining like, oh, my God, what, oh, have, not we, knowing it, what have we done? <laughs> Matt's going to watch this and just have not seen any other movies and just be like totally confused and like, what the fuck is happening? Like, this movie makes no sense. I guy doing putting a bolo tie on and a white button? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Oh, that, when, he went, when he put on the ice cream wardrobe, I was like, oh. Man. This, yeah. I, I love I love oh. that this is the movie that finally embraces the fact that he's an ice cream vendor. He has yeah. this. He, I got to yeah, play this. Play the line. He, he's got this amazing uh, opening please, line of the movie please here. Please tell me, Justin, you're playing the uh, the I was an ice cream soldier. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're about to hear it right now. Yeah. My That's name it. is Reggie. I was an ice cream vendor by trade. Now I'm a soldier. A soldier in a war his army of the living dead <laughs> it's just like, so right, serious well, he's I embraced like, it now i also like by trade <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he was he wasn't his born heart into wasn't music <laughs> yeah he, yeah, like he was he had the heart of a yeah. rocker but he was an ice cream vendor my grandpa trade. was an ice cream vendor <laughs> yeah <Ice> cream vendor. <laughs> i'm i can't say enough about reggie banister like <laughs> 
Oh man. The man crush level is on. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just the like is does he have like the most magnetic ponytail outside of Oh like, my god. We get to see his Michael Bolton. Yeah, we get yeah. to see his full mane. <laughs> his full mane yeah. multiple times in this movie. Unsheathed. <laughs> and when the hair goes down too. It's, oh yeah. It's party time. Like, oh my god. The the dos, the Doseki scene with them on the hood, yes, um, <laughs> is like bromance on a level that like maybe Top Gun has reached that level, <laughs> with like the volleyball sequence. Yes, and I was like, if Tony Scott shot this, it would just be a top <laughs> for sure. But no, um, it's uh, that scene on the hood. I I just. <laughs> In my notebook, watching this film, I just circled that like eighteen times. I, I love that, like, yeah, that scene is like, this is how it could have been, you guys. We could have <laughs> been best, listening to Jody play that, guitar. <laughs> that I heard that I heard about Oblivion. So, like, one of the things that they got, like, like Doseki is because they shot a, a lot of it uh, uh, with, down in San Pedro, and uh, Doseki has donated a bunch of of beer to to be involved with it. And one of the grips on Phantasm One ended up shooting this one and his first beer ever was one of the one of his first alcoholic drink ever was on the set of the phantasm movie from the donated dos Equis, which is like <laughs> the type of filmmaking that's happening in this series which is just beautiful <laughs> that's a great story <laughs> oh man um I, so yeah we get a lot of reggie voiceover this time mm-hmm. and it we pick up right where we left him being suspended by all the balls in the corner uh, and I like that now. Well, okay, so the tall man's always called Mike Boy, right? Mm-hmm. And now Reggie has a nickname too from the tall man. He is the small man. <laughs> <laughs> the small man. man. Small man. I was like, all right, fair enough. Compared to you, aren't we all? But um, <laughs> yeah, there's just so much old footage that you're just constantly like, wow. Is that old footage? Did they use like another little kid shot from behind? Like I can't tell. And, and, yeah, and, yeah. There's a lot. It's 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 blended pretty seamlessly, and it's like they must have they they had a lot of great shots from the original one. I when they showed the scene where the tall man gets uh, hung by Jody, I I thought that we were finally going to get closure on <laughs> Justin's point that like did their whole plan to trap him in a mine shaft do anything like I thought that like, that <laughs> yeah. was going to be the whole like oh no he actually got there and then he demise you know, he died and we figured that all out but then it's like when we find out Jody's fate and he does confirm I guess in that reality that he did die in a car crash yeah but this movie <laughs> as much as it's driven to give you answers is actually offering zero answers it's like it's pretty impenetrable once you get to the end. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's something that makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> is that he's like, I'm so sure that Jody died because I remember like going to the funeral with mom and dad. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. Mom and dad definitely <laughs> died way before the events of the first movie at yeah. all. Like, it makes no sense. So I don't know how, like, is that just supposed to show us that he really has no sense of reality that entire time? Or? It did make me think was was uh, Jebediah Morningside's grandmother or wife, perhaps. Yes, I'm not sure. Yes, she was the fortune teller. She was the fortune teller. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Looked like the same so, lady. Yeah, That's cool. No, so, so he shot three endings for the first one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did I read that right? And then, so, and then one of those was used in this or no was this one of the endings that he didn't u- use does anybody know i think this is one of the endings he didn't use okay which must be the must be the um hanging? the hanging scene and then maybe the yeah. reggie the reggie driving off scene yep yeah like them drive yeah reggie and him on the ice cream truck driving away driving into the darkness mm-hmm. which looks really i did cool. i did get insight in the book from uh the scene from two where they blow up the house how they did that and actually this is the thing where i'm gonna loop this in so we we on sequel rights love to talk about explosions yeah. and we rank explosions by <laughs> on the dark man scale because yeah. the dark man scale is really there's an ex- there's one explosion in the first dark man movie that uh put a stuntman who's fine now but in in serious danger <laughs> yeah uh, because it went off and it is one of the biggest explosions you'll ever see. Uh, <laughs> there is a story in his book where he met Sam Raimi as they were talking about two and Sam Raimi was working on dark man and he offered up two things. 
a uh, special effects makeup person who uh, helped him on Evil Dead 2 and his pyrotechnics guy. Oh! So the guy who did the explosions for Phantasm and oh, the rest of the Phantasm movies is the Darkman uh, pyrotechnics guy. Nice. The guy that screwed up big time. And the guy, the guy who screwed up big time for Darkman. But it was actually before they shot Darkman. Okay. Uh, but how they got that house was actually kind of interesting. It was one of the old Caltrans houses that they got rid of when they were expanding LAX. And so they, they were they were selling those houses for five hundred dollars. You had, just had to pick up the house and move it. Uh, but they so they were like, hey, Caltrans, like, could we just blow it up instead? Uh, and they were like, sure, like if you use the proper things. But then apparently they got a fire marshal who was like, oh, really strict and not letting them do as many things they want to do and not letting them use the yield of explosives. But then when Angus Scrim came on set, he was like, wait, this is the Phantasm movie. <laughs> and apparently he was just a giant fan. And according to Don was just let them do whatever they wanted <laughs> and, and let them do this giant explosion on the house, which is just an incredible story. But so they had one take of it and they did three setups that were set at three different timelines that were intercut throughout the movie, which wow. is just, Wonderful stuff. Wow. The, yeah, the, the explosions uh, throughout the series deleted, have been good. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, we also get a deleted scene of uh, the tall man murdering a dog in cold <laughs> blood. Yeah. That was yeah. interesting. <laughs> I love that that was a thing they shot. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I wonder why they cut it. That was the most brutal kill I felt like in the entire franchise. <laughs> it's just so, I mean, he was so mean. <laughs> It was, I, I, I mean, this movie is all about crazy shit happening. And even that, I was like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, especially because it's not even for Mike and Jody to see. They don't right. see it. They're long gone. It's only for the audience to be like, wow, the tall man is a dick. <laughs> He's not you know? fucking around. <laughs> it's like they needed that as a reminder for anybody that didn't see the first three movies on what you're dealing with. Oh, yeah, he's a bad dude, thing, right. Yeah, it's one thing to see spears dig into people's skulls <laughs> and, you know, Jawas walking around when they got more money, you know, <laughs> put some creature faces on them, got a little creep show with it. And, uh, but it's another thing to have a dog get ran over by a hearse. Yeah. It just kind of sets everything into perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so a large part of the movie is two, you know, different paths. You have Mike in the hearse going off into the desert and then you have reggie just like wandering around aimlessly maybe gonna end up where mike is <laughs> like yeah he's he's against it but it's not quite clear where he's going causing Actually, major car accidents it's, <laughs> it's always clear where he's going because he's yes. going to a motel with a lady <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird because like he sees this woman at a rest stop and he looks at her and like she gets in the car and she drives away and he doesn't do anything. And I was like, wow, that was a weird scene. He's learned like, his lesson. I, yeah. I was I was like, wow, <laughs> could it really be that they just put this in as a character development moment for us to see that Reggie has really changed his ways and he's right. not going to be, you know, drawn away from the path by a random girl. And then five minutes later, I was like, no, that that was just way too hopeful. <laughs> I love his excuse every single time for being like, I need to go into this motel room with this woman. He's like, I've been on the road a long time. Like that's the justification every time is that I've been on the road for 16 hours. We've been on the road for months. And the <laughs> hotel room is disgusting. Oh my it's God. Yes. Motel. Sleep in the car. <laughs> I would have slept in the car 10,000%. Oh, yeah. There's a whole thing where he's trying to be cute and being like, we have room service. And he picks up this rotting like pizza. Molding pizza. Ugh. Our and TV they, gets all the sleeping channels. in this filthy bed. <laughs> Can we talk about just before they end up in the room too? Like yeah. him driving by her on the yes. highway. Yes. Yeah. Doing, was it an illegal pass by <laughs> the <laughs> lane highway? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, the book and she checks him out and then she hits the turtle. Yep. And then goes flying. And so him doing the illegal pass by destroys her car. Car. <laughs> and then she doesn't seem to have a problem with that and ends up in a motel. And then he goes full Reggie Bannister ponytail, <laughs> hair down party time yeah yeah and then and then we go into the rock one of the roger avery scenes in the original script right that they borrowed from Stone i believe so yes with the um 
with the spheres coming out of her um her yeah cavity. yeah i was pretty disappointed in myself for not realizing that that was going to happen as soon as <laughs> I, I was too started moving around i was like oh something's gonna happen right now but i don't know what it is and then when it when he opened her shirt i was like why did I not see that coming? My my brain was honestly thinking, I was like, come on, Reggie, you wake her up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, once again, Reggie the rapist strikes yeah. again. Like, He's like, whoa. Oh, he always picks the right, but he never learns. <laughs> <laughs> I also just love the idea of the tall man just being like, like his minions being like, ah, oh, come on, tall man. Like another hot lady. And he's like, he falls for it every time. Like, let's do it. <laughs> It's like the I small man also, will never learn. I was uh, also wondering how a flannel shirt becomes like six buttons unbuttoned <laughs> while you're sleeping. Because <laughs> he wakes up and she's just like almost splayed out. Yeah. Him. And by the way, this entire film franchise, if you have to put a couple things in, the, in a museum from it, like at the LACMA forever. Yeah. One of them's Reggie's ponytail for sure. <laughs> the, the other one, I think, Preserved. is flannel shirts. Red flannel yeah, shirt. Yeah. 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 This whole franchise is just loaded with flannel shirts, flannel shirts. and they're all great. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, amazing stuff. Um, so that's the end of her. She's out of the movie. <laughs> Uh, but one thing, speaking about car explosions and think, speaking about her, when he does save her, the the stunt of her car getting totaled is incredible. Like, it looks great. And then uh, he starts running away with her. And she's like, I thought cars only exploded that way in movies. And then it's <laughs> giant explosion, which I actually liked that meta joke. I <laughs> that was goofy. That was pretty that was good. I didn't hate it. Yeah. yeah. Where do the three car explosions in this film rank? with the sequel rights fam as far as Ooh. Concerned. So th this whole series has been great with explosions. Yeah. Car they ones have been, in particular. Yeah. Um I think that the first hearse is the biggest one. I think that that's the most unexpected in Phantasm 1. It's just like holy shit. Yeah, like, that's it's basically just a, like that's just some 20-year-olds with gasoline. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a small pole on the side of the road that just goes boom like yeah. in a giant explosion. Like that was still my favorite. Um but yeah, yeah. they've all been good. That that reminds me of uh, we me and my buddy when we were making we, we had a dumb like cop show that we'd make for our morning announcements. It was called The Law, <laughs> where we dress up like basically Beastie Boys, sabotage detectives with like fake mustaches and then run around and do this fake like cop show that has like the same energy of Phantasm. But we had an explosion. We went out to the salt flats, <laughs> uh, which like spoiler alert, if you're a young filmmaker, go out to the middle of the desert. Your lighting will be perfect. It'll be great. Um, <laughs> and we stole a bunch of pallets from the back of a Walmart and covered them in gasoline and then like set them on fire and threw a bunch of bottle rockets in there and then showed that at my school. What? <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> and that's where the explosions in the Phantasm series rank. It feels just like that. <laughs> How do you not get in trouble for that? Uh... I'm a white man. Yeah, I, was say, I used oh to get God. in trouble for shit like starting a gossip book and then I'd be hauled into the principal's office. You know, there, oh it was the amount of times that they tried to suspend me for things that I had shot and put on the announcements in high school is a long list. OK, fine, <laughs> fine. Ugh, speaking of cops, did you know that Reggie thinks that some cops can be real assholes? I did. He know had that. his a cab moment here. <laughs> The, the Reggie versus the zombie Terminator cop uh, was was one of the best five minutes, I feel like, in the first four films. It's so much fun. Like, yeah. I so one of the things that came out of this is that I, I can't remember if it was two or three, but he'd hired some makeup effects guy and he found and and Don found out that uh, that he had double booked some movie it was like Deep Space Six or something like that. And he was like, I don't think you're going to have the bandwidth to do these two movies like I'm really upset about. It. And the guy's like, don't worry. It's my my assistants will be here to help you. Like, it'll be fine. And his assistants ended up being Stan Winston and Greg Nicotero. <laughs> so uh, they uh, did this guy's uh, makeup for this movie for free. Wow. Wow. And that is why for $650,000, this Terminator cop looks pretty great. Yeah. And he's got a dude By all way, like squished um, up. <laughs> yeah. Um, Andrew, I watched this movie this morning while I was eating breakfast and <laughs> the scene where the yellow blood goes into Reggie. Oh, oh God. 
I laughed out loud and almost choked on whatever I was eating at the same time. And I, then I read that they had shot that five times. And I was like, how did my guy do that five times? <laughs> I didn't see that. That's amazing. I think he's gotten it in his mouth almost every movie. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> I love how like like he, he ends up on top of it and then like he's lurching forward and there's that moment in the scene where you're just like no like this isn't gonna happen and then immediately just like the mustard fountain emerges <laughs> <laughs> yeah th- this this scene is where I got all my uh, great uh, Reggie dialogue for uh, this episode <laughs> oh man uh, do you have something hit us with something right now fuck you <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one that's a good one <laughs> um justin do i i remember you talking about in the first phantasm podcast um did you buy the vinyl of the score yes or did you buy the, track? the vinyl yeah mondo put out a, a suite uh with amazing artwork uh for the for the original film i'm gonna ask you to send me a link to that okay at the end of this but um but two i i, I wanted to just Talk about for a second, just these iconic films that come out of the 70s and 80s and have all these legs that we kind of go back to and we share with friends and become like these almost, I don't know, they just, the shelf life is just like never ending. I mm-hmm. I find that, you know, when you go back to and you go Carpenter's Halloween or like Freakin's The Exorcist and some of the, the Dario Argento stuff with like the original Suspiria and this like the one connected tissue between all those is the scores are undeniably like memorable and incredible. Mm-hmm. And I I'm fascinated by um, franchises like this and Halloween, like when there's always that iconic score that you can go back to at any time, but when they do the sequels, it's like, it's almost like peppered in, like you, yeah. you, you get a moment of it. Like you'd never really want to go into it. But when we go back to the, to the originals, it's like when you hear that score, and it's whole bravado and gravitas and like the way it was originally p- supposed to be heard. It always gives me goosebumps. And I was just curious. I mean, you guys have obviously watched a lot of sequels. If you've noticed that with some of the iconic films and when you go back and watch the original, if that's something that you kind of, I don't know. I always find it interesting. Like if the score is shit, it doesn't seem to have the legs. Absolutely. So I'm going to interject with one point here. And then Justin, I want you to expound on this <laughs> no. one. Justin is a music supervisor by trade and thinks about this stuff professionally. And two, he has a horror score vinyl collection that I think it might be unrivaled on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Justin, so do I right behind me. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Nice. Fight, fight, fight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ask you what I'm missing after. Yeah. This. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's great. But yeah, Justin, uh, I think that we talked a little bit about the score in the first one, but I, it's such an important part of this. And and I think that uh, if you have thoughts on that, I, I would actually love to hear them. I mean, this is like the, the original one is so great because I feel like, you know, I think same same probably with Halloween uh, where it's like they don't you know, they don't have a lot to work with as far as like, they're, they're not such a low budget. They're not going to have a full orchestra or anything like that. So they're working with just like the sounds that they have. And at the time, you know, they're like working with lots of synths and stuff. And I just love that it's so simple. Um, but then eventually like in all these movies, the, the score ends up getting filled out in the later sequels. And sometimes I think like in the first two phantasms, like that fleshing out of the themes to be a little bit more bombastic sounds kind of cool. But then now by this movie, it's getting a little bit tired and like, you can tell that they, uh, it just sounds a little bit cheaper. Cause maybe they're, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't quite have that analog sound as the first, the first movie does, but um, yeah, the, the, the phantasm score is amazing. And synth has come back so hard now. It oh yeah. Feels like, you know, when you watch phantasm, you're like, Oh, I mean, yeah, this 79 shot in 77, but it might as well be 2020. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Everything comes back around. So I'm curious, Justin. Um, it, so Fred Myro and Malcolm Seagrave did the first one. And Christopher L. Stone was the composer on four. And I think he did two and three, right? Yeah, right? I think Fred Myra was involved maybe for the first couple, but uh, I think now he's credited as just like having written the main theme in this one. So I don't think he's involved on this fourth one. Okay. Which is maybe and why. Is, any, is there any trivia or kind of lore behind the change in it? Um, 
That I don't know. So I I know that uh, the the first one was through Universal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, no. So the first one, two or and three. The second, yeah, what the was, second two. What was the first movie through? Uh, just I don't know. It was just his. I don't remember which studio it was, but he had done to another studio film with them, and Fred Myro was with. I think it was Universal Music, and uh, they become friends through that, and so they were allowed to do it. But I think that uh, it was one of those things where the the relationship with Universal soured, or whoever it was, and they he basically lost access to Fred. Like Fred was not like legally allowed to work on them anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, and you can tell. Like I feel like it suffers a bit in this fourth one it's you know and then it, and then it will get to it later but it gets bastardized a bit in the end credits <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yes! i don't know i don't know if you made it that far uh matt to, to to hear the very end of the credits i didn't i didn't but now i want to oh, oh my god. god oh my god okay well we gotta wait we gotta wait yeah yeah, yeah. Um, well yeah <laughs> okay so we pretty much caught reggie up but let's go back and mike's journey he's kind of driving aimlessly through the desert um there's a really great uh, part where he you know as one does sits in the back of his car lights his antique candelabra and starts journaling yeah uh you know a- as one does we've um, all been there i yeah. mean what else can you do in 2020 candles in a know? car so smart <laughs> candles so in smart. a car <laughs> <laughs> i i really loved that um he he just has a lot of flashbacks and hallucinations. He, um, he kills a scorpion with a rock. He also he kills, kills a, a Jawa. Jawa with a rock. This yeah. was, that um, scene was point, so great. Yeah, at one point he was seeing Jawas, and then I was pretty sure he even saw a sand person in the. <laughs> and I was like, "What?" But I don't even know what that was. It like, was one it of the like he's one of the gravers. I think it was one of the oh. gravers. Yeah. Or whatever they're okay. called. Okay, the I was like, one. that guy looks like a sand person. Like, what <laughs> no, is he happening? Was sand people move single file. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Well, there was only one. Yeah, you know? they gotta hide their tracks. I wanted that. Um, I wanted that scene where he like is progressively squishing bigger things to just continue. <laughs> where it's like, what can I squish next with this with a bigger rock? <laughs> And by the way, a lot of this was, you know, Death Valley. And we said we saw the Joshua yeah. trees and stuff, but it was also a lot of Lone Pine, Lone Pine, home yeah. of the Graboids, Tremors, yes. um, lots and of many other places. Yeah. Yes. Lots of movies. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and I was going to mention, too, when you were talking earlier about some of the legends that worked on this movie. Um, yeah. Dan Trachtenberg was a grip on this movie. What? Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. In the, in the credits is Daniel. And I was like, could that? B and I looked it up and it sure was. That's wow, crazy. That's cool. Wow. Yeah. There's I speaking of people who have been working in this, there's this story in uh uh Corsa Kelly's book where uh they're on the second movie when they were shooting up in the Angeles Crest, uh the grip truck, the brakes failed heading down from like foothill and 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 going down. Ugh. And it was this, it was this young like PA driving it and ended up like he had to go through like like the brakes went out there was no runaway place and had to go through that intersection where it dead ends there basically they drove this thing with no brakes all the way down and then there was like a denny's there at the time and he plowed it into a cadillac to stop it and the uh the pa was shane hurlbutt who is a dp and uh the the you most people would probably know him as the man that christian bale yelled at uh, uh, but uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but he was that was his first young thing and and they they totaled the camera package they totaled the lighting package oh my god um but he he saved people's lives and i can't imagine like i hate I hated having to drive the grip truck. It terrified me. Famously, Bruce Campbell on Evil Dead 2 like sheared the top off of it while he was there trying to back out. And uh that that story is insane to me. Like I driving down that hill with no brakes in a in a tr- grip truck is terrifying. Yikes. Maybe Christian Bale knew that story and that's why he didn't feel safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would that make Shane famous for two fourth installments? Of yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Livian and Salvation. Yeah. Yep. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, okay. So, yes. Back to Mike. He decides to walk through a number of the, they call them now, dimensional forks. Yes. Uh, Which... And that's. Oh, go ahead. He Sorry. He sees uh, Jebediah Springfield Morningside. <laughs> 
I was going to say in the first movie, I was in the, in the second movie, I was like, I really hope for a tuning fork callback. And <laughs> yes, boy, were my my calls heard in this movie. <laughs> I love that. It's like a weapon against I them. love about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amazing. I love how this flashback is super interesting. And he's like Angus Scrim or Jebediah Morningside could not be more inviting. And is like eerily like Stepford wife, like cordial to him. Uh, but then Mike immediately leaves. And then two minutes later, he's like, I have to get back. And it's like, why did you leave in the first place? I have so many questions. Uh, well, I, I was just like really shocked. I guess not shocked because I'm sure he was a great actor. But Angus Scrim's like complete transformation because he's essentially wearing the same clothes and styled the same way he is a completely different person than we've been seeing for three and a half movies and you're just like what the like you're as confused as mike is you know and and it was just great acting by angus scrim if you watch him at any of like there's photo of him getting like a fangoria award or anything like that Mm -hmm. he is the sweetest like Actually, there's a story about the shooting of this one where they end up on uh, where the tall man's leaving his all night show at the El Rey. Uh, walking oh, yeah. down. <laughs> I love I love this. this. So random. Yeah, this is Which a... apparently shot. Oh, go ahead, Justin. Oh, no, I was going to say this is another. I recorded this other example of the great uh, chemistry between Jody and Mike nowadays. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. oh, here we go. What is this place? You mean when? We can't stay here. There's a risk of infection. <laughs> but when he's like, what is this place? I was like, also, oh, it's Wilshire Boulevard. Construction. <laughs> yeah. So the Metro construction is going to tear up the entire street. Yeah, guys. exactly. Yeah. Um, so apparently, apparently permitless yep. done Thanksgiving morning. Uh, <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they went to like, like Mike's apartment at 4 a.m. And apparently cops came like, like swerving up, asking them what they're doing. And then the actor who plays uh, the tall man, uh, Angus, just shot them a smile and was very charming. And they said, all right, move along. Wow. That, that's how that they stole so that great. shot. That's crazy. I was so excited because. I immediately could tell that they were on Wilshire and I was like, Oh my God, they're going to walk past my old office. Like the old blank spaces, mid Wilshire. <laughs> yeah. And I like, I was like, come on, just keep walking like another block because like that was 5450. They got up to 5458 and I was like, no, <laughs> and then they cut away from it. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, when I, when I read that, that's how they pulled off the Wilshire. So I was watching it and by the way, like right down the street from my old apartment too in West Hollywood. Um, shout out West Hollywood. And it brought <laughs> back, like, I, when I was, so Tyler, to your story about, like, going out in the middle of the desert and yeah. blowing some stuff out, like, when you're younger, like, when I was trying to put my reel together and do, like, spec spots and short films, uh-huh. one of the spots I, I was trying to do was a PSA for charity water and, like, what a city would look like without clean water. And so I was like, okay, I want to shoot Los Angeles empty. And so the only way I could figure out is like I got a 7D and I would go out Sunday mornings and holiday mornings like at the crack of dawn uh-huh. and shoot an empty city. And so when I saw that Wilshire scene, I was like, how, how did they do this on no money? And then read that they they did, <laughs> did exactly before. that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Dude, that's that's what I did for a year to pull it off. So I was like, I mean, this movie, obviously, it's got a lot of what the fuck moments, but <laughs> just with like the the, the, the heart of uh the filmmaking and just the independent you know kind of inspiration going into it like i can't help but just you know give it an 11 out of 10 well (laughs) i think it gets into the the point that you're talking about of these movies from from the 70s and early 80s these horror films that that have these amazing legs that 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 endure for so long and i think that there's this Oh God! To use an advertising term, there's this authenticity to them that's <laughs> that's real, and and it, you can feel that type of energy, and it's something that, like, even when you watch them, it kind of feels like somebody's inviting you in to like hang out and like, hey, like we're gonna do this thing. It's a little bit dangerous, but you know, it's gonna be a lot of fun, and it's gonna be a little bit weird, but it's gonna be what it is. So like, 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 come on this journey with us. And I think that so many of those movies from that time. Um, feel that way and i think that modern horror there's so many movies that are trying to replicate that by through the lens of nostalgia but the things that are so much more successful are the movies that are actually just capturing that spirit of you know i'm going to make something with what i can what i have and to make something great i think that uh, autopsy of jane doe is a great example of that mm, yeah have you guys talked about the psychology of just the filmmaker in general when 
like for Coscarelli to do the fourth installment of this and to know that like what's landing is the uniqueness of the story and some of the camp elements. And at that point, it's like, are you trying to hit that target? Or are you just doing what you always did? Where, I mean, I think to your point, Tyler, it's like you, you try to like recapsulate that nostalgic magic sometimes by doing something camp, like focusing on the camp yep. as well. And oftentimes we see films that fall on their face more times than not doing that. But I'm just curious, like if you listen to anything with his um, audio book, if there was the intention of like trying to, you know, mirror the success of the first or if he was just continuing to just tell the story in his head. I think that like so interestingly, he never wanted to do a sequel. And the only reason that he started writing a sequel, uh, a script for two is that he was trying to sell another movie. And his agent told him that if he had a sequel for Phantasm, which was a successful movie, he might be able to do a bait and switch, basically, of coming in and being like, oh, I have the sequel. I also have this other script that you could really like. Um, but I think that that. Uh, his muse in a lot of ways is Reggie and Mike and working with these people. And so like when the opportunity came, like a hey, phantasm might be the next thing he was like, Oh, this might be really exciting. Like it starts off right here and doing this. And so I will say for four, he does specifically mention that the no studio interference and, and really doing it for the way that he did the first one allowed him to get back to the kind of dream narrative structure which he wanted to keep throughout. So I think that that one was intentional. And I think that it, some of it is, is some stuff in this movie that's kind of groundbreaking in terms of fan service. Like him suiting up as the ice cream man is a fan service moment in yeah. 1998 where there's yeah. not really, you know, we've watched a lot of sequels at this point and I can't quite, accurately answer your question because i think this is one of the only ones where it's the same creative team for the first for all mm. four movies yeah i can't think of another i mean tremors is close but that's switching out you know directors and, and writers and things yeah. like that like he is such a singular voice in these that um i think he's he's always been trying to tell that same story but there has been other meddling and this one just because of the budget was uncut and in, in its most pure form I think that's what I enjoyed about it so much mm -hmm. too. It's a singular voice for, mm -hmm. you know, let's see, 90 minutes, three, it's, you know, for six hours that you're yeah. in it for four. And I was curious, one of my questions for the sequel rights fam is what's the comp for the director doing the first four films, the same director doing the first four films outside of like Richard Donner, Lethal Weapon and like Michael Bay doing five Transformers. Transformers <laughs> in, in, the, in the horror genre, what is what is the comp for that? Like, is there somebody that's done four in a Nucky, row? Lucky, maybe. Mm. Uh, I maybe. Yeah. I don't know if he was directing all of them though. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, the Tremors. Team I mean, did the first four. Yeah, they yeah. switching. Different I mean, directors. we did Rambo. Uh, Stallone did a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's certainly a singular vision. <laughs> yes. um, I, no, I don't think. I think that the, the closest comp would be a a, a modern TV show where yeah. one director does every episode um, of a, of, a, of a series or a mini series. Like, I don't think that there's anything i mean halloween's not even there because yeah, you know yeah. carpenter you know gave that up he, his his influence is there for a few of them but um yeah he I, tried to turn that franchise into like every movie was going to be a different, different yeah movie. yeah it's, it was his cloverfield <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. um yeah i mean i think that's what makes it so special i mean i was trying to think of a comp but i was like this i mean the four movies feel like they're it's a singular, you know, yeah. kind of cinematic grammar that goes through all four of them and a voice. And it feels like somebody like really trying to get to the bottom of something that, you know, popped in his head when he was maybe in his late teens, early twenties. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, you know, it's been a fun, it's been a fun beginning of Halloween season uh, going through these four. I'm really curious about five because it's a different director. Yeah. 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 But I think he still Which wrote the script. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it. I was there. I was around Beyond Fest when they were screening it, but hmm. I missed that night for whatever reason. I was like, the, the the other thing that came to mind, it doesn't go to four, but we did do the Basket Case series. That's oh, yeah. Frank Hennen, yeah. Frank Hennenlauter, who did actually a good call. all three. Yeah. Ugh, love and that's Basket a very Case. singular. <laughs> that's a very singular uh, imagination there, too. Yeah. No, it's two. Two heads. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Ah, uh, Belial. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> anyway, um, so but yeah, we, I, oh, go uh, ahead, Liz. I was just gonna say it's you know you brought up kind of how these movies are really like uh, exploring the process of grieving, um, mm-hmm. and you know this one kind of I think even goes into it even more because it kind of almost we haven't really seen like the anger and the denial stages, you know, and in this one, Mike's really angry at Jody. And when Jody came back in the last one, we didn't really see that. But this time he's like, no, don't trust Jody. You can't like, I'm mad at him for ditching me, you know, and all these things, which are really interesting. And then we even see Mike, um, you know, go so far as to kill himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, or attempt to kill himself. I don't know if he fully did and then came back to life or something, but um, yeah, he uses a really, really crappy crate to, uh, (laughs) to hang himself from a tree in the desert. That that scene when they show him hanging himself, the first time they show the noose, I'm like, just before that, he was in a desert where there's nothing. And the first time they show the news, it just looks like it's hanging from the sky. And I was like, yeah. where is he hanging himself? Which, which, which we do. did see a priest hung that way from nothing. Yeah, That's so. true. Necklace. That's true. Yeah. And he has those uh, psychic powers now, so he could have psychically That's hung right. himself. But yeah, apparently uh, the tall man's going to decide when he dies. That's right. It's only up to him. <laughs> I love like I really like there is so much to think about with the world building of all of this of like did Jebediah Morningside going to the other side you know did he go on some crazy journey and then come back it changed was he yeah. imitated was like there's so much like that try that's tried to answer in this one but so much really cool mythology and thinking I think that that hanging scene being constructed and written knowing that you have this footage of this previous hanging scene and have it move the story forward and, and deal with all those themes that you were talking about Eliz, and kind of have it resolve in this way that is I think not I, I think that if you have that footage and you're writing a script you end up writing to a certain point and it, it's for me if I was doing that right off the top of my head it would be a plot thing it would be something that's going to that that might even be your climax right but in this it kind of ends up on this more subtle meditation of grief and loss and and what happens with death and and how that feeling of loss ages with you and it kind of is this nebulous thing that is that happens in this movie and then moves on and then you know some silver balls fly out of a woman's tits. So like <laughs> it's, it's a really, it's uh, got everything. Yeah. It's it, I, 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 the balance of it and the intention of it is fascinating to me. Well, I, oh, overall less balls in this one. Yeah. Yep. Uh, or less different. Well, balls. there was that one crazy shot of like a million balls flying through the uh, mausoleum in the uh, beginning. The, That's the, pir- the piranha shot. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a swarm of them, which was very cool. And we get the return of that like blade that they use to like go into Mike's head all the time. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, what is the purpose of the outer legs of that implement? <laughs> like, you know, other than to make it look scarier. <laughs> They're speed bolts. It lines up the place. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway, but I loved um, uh yeah. I, I, I kind of like really loved all this stuff with the uh, dimensional fork and all that. It it yeah. really felt like once it got further into what was going on, it really felt a lot like uh, the most recent Twin Peaks season with all this weird like, yes. like when he like when he goes back and there's that crazy machine. It made me think of that like weird like teapot thing and stuff and in, yeah. in the most recent Twin Peaks and and I, I just like I I. I think it's really interesting that this movie, I don't know what's going to happen in the next one, but this one d- seems to totally, I mean, it, I guess it does totally get rid of the idea that he's like some alien and he's like building an alien army with these Jawas or whatever. And uh, I mean, it, I don't know. Does it, it kind of, it kind of well, does. Because, right? Okay. So Jebediah goes into the thing and then Jody specifically says that Jebediah never came back. Mm-hmm. So I was under the impression that this evil being takes the body and then comes back to mm-hmm. her. Oh, when... I was thinking more like he went and just like went mad or saw some crazy stuff and like Could be. Jebediah as he was doesn't come yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't think of it literally. I don't recognize yeah. that man anymore. Also, <laughs> yeah. we find out that Jody's a liar. So that's yeah. true. Um, so let's talk about the ending because I'm like not 100% sure what actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> Mike constructed his own sphere out of car parts. 
Yes. yes. A toy. <laughs> and then, but under that is like a bomb? A hole? <laughs> well, yeah. no. It, that with the power of phantasm, everything ends with an explosion. <laughs> yes. Are, are we to assume that Mike is to be the tall man after the tall man's done? The, this is what I, I feel like the show is, or the movie's getting at. And I, that- I, I also thought like that what was going to happen was that that sphere was like a prototype and this was like the first sphere ever made. It, Mike made the first sphere or something. Oh, that's But that didn't quite play out in this movie, at least. That's that's what there, I thought was happening, though. There's a couple, like, early Tesla moments in this movie. You have the yeah. new sphere that Mike created. You also have the self-driving Hearst. Yeah. <laughs> where the, the coach will drive itself. Yeah, it'll, it'll <laughs> and drive itself. And so... And then there's that there's that moment too where Mike is the tall man and I'm mm-hmm. trying to remember the dream sequence. I don't remember or if it is. Well, no, he attacks Reggie, right? Yeah. Like that's right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Jokes him. And it, it's it's hard to tell what's a dream sequence in this movie, actually. Because there's yeah. the there's the other element where uh uh you know he's writing all these things directly to Reggie. Reggie finds the uh the hearse with the writing in it and so it's it's unclear what's happening when and i don't necessarily need it to be uh nailed down you know i don't need that information. yeah there's even a civil war flashback for some reason yeah yes <laughs> which, <laughs> which apparently roger avery has a cameo in yep he's apparently one of the dead guys <laughs> that's right <Yeah. laughs> uh, which it's like also uh, it's fucking crazy that like in for six hundred fifty thousand dollars they're like yeah and we're gonna do a steady cam civil war shot and it's <laughs> apparently like- it only cost two hundred dollars <laughs> yeah. yeah i saw I, that I, that was in one of the trivias it said they paid a civil war reenactment group a two hundred dollar donation and just had them you know stand around i it's that's in, it's just it's that's just a flat no like and it's for, for so many things it's for a scene that like makes no sense i don't <laughs> know <laughs> how does that where does that fall in line with anything? I don't really, I don't, yeah, I don't especially get it. Isn't it Morningside in like Oregon canonically? Yeah. Also it's old Mike, but then we see Mike as a kid. So I don't know what, to, yeah. I don't yeah. Really I know what's it's going or what it is. Well, yeah, I, I guess Morningside in the first one is Oregon, but Morningside is also the actual name of the cemetery in Long Beach. Yeah. But the first movie takes place in Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. So where do we leave everybody? Jody, uh, well, dead. I know that Reggie still has the quad shotgun. That's the only thing okay. that I know. <laughs> That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. Also <laughs> something that should be put in a museum. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want a replica so bad. <laughs> I would buy that. Uh, okay, so we have uh, Jody dead. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Mike, perhaps without a brain, if they took the ball out of his head. Yeah. yeah. Mike uh, seemed to be or dying. Or his tiny brain or his beef jerky brain. Um, and Reggie is, I, I mean, where Reggie ends up is, is a moot point because we just find out where Reggie, Reggie ended up at the beginning of the next movie. That's true. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. And then the tall man is still at it. Hard to know, he right? Sucked like into a, the thing, right? Yeah. He kills, he kills that version of him. But I, I think that this is either a multiple reality or multiple timeline thing uh, yeah, right, where yeah. it's either like that's a uh, old tall, tall man or like, so like that might be the end of his timeline, but you know, there's other interse- You can ask JJ about it. <laughs> yeah. It was very, very inconclusive. And overall, I kind of just felt like the, I mean, I enjoyed many moments of it but Uh as a movie narrative it was like so all over the place and then kind of just comes to this final confrontation and you're kind of like okay but like what actually happened (laughs) (laughs) yeah i find myself more attracted to the phantasms that are a little bit more all over the place like yeah the the more grounded version of phantasm two and three I enjoyed, but I was like, okay, this is this is point A to B to C, you know, like mm-hmm. the road trip version of two. It's yep. super fun, but this one, it felt like a lot of energy of the first one. And is this the first one that doesn't end with somebody getting pulled through glass? Yeah, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's yeah. Just, yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. I was almost waiting for the glass. I, was almost the <laughs> I, went, the, I watched to the end of the credits to be like, yeah. someone's getting pulled <laughs> through glass here. <laughs> yeah, and Oh man, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I liked that little kid in three, 
and, and this one is so yeah. all over the place with the but we have a little kid in Mike's and all these flashbacks, but they've got to be out of footage at this point, right? Is there any new footage? To they have to. Mike? It's incredible. Like they've I used we, every second of footage. It's nuts. Like we we talk about it like this is a thing that happened, but like the way that they use the footage from the first movie in this in this film is in every in, movie and in incredible. Well. Yes, yeah, yeah, but this one, but yeah. like this movie is incredible. Yeah. It's incredible the way that they use things. Like, I, it's, it's, I don't know if there's anything else quite like it, honestly. Yeah, yeah they, it's really, it's very powerful. I mean, like, you know, sorry, boyhood, but it's really cool <laughs> when you have like the old yeah. Mike looking off into the distance and it's able to like seamlessly go into a yeah. shot of him as a child, like making that same face. So, I yeah. Think you all just inspired me next Halloween to do Phantasm One into Phantasm Four. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You can like, because it is all that footage and it's all that story that Don had like mm-hmm. laid out that was trimmed down to a very nice 90 minutes. I love the 90 minute run times, but, um, but there, there was a lot more meat on that bone to chew on. And I, I thought the way he incorporated it in four is, was just brilliant. I mean, just kind of having the math equation in front of them of how much money they had and like, okay, how am I going to do something interesting and further the narrative, but also like do something that's, you know, phantasm and, and add some question marks. Um, yeah, uh, I was kind of floored by four. I think it's my second and, favorite one. Like, yeah, yeah, I think I agree. Like, I can't, I can't, uh, given the same task, I am certain I wouldn't be able to pull it off. Like, it is something that is, is tr- truly his creation. And it, like, in a lot of ways, like that stream like structure brings it back in line with the first one in a way that's amazing. Yeah, the, uh, when I was watching those, some of those scenes that, you know, they use from the first movie and it's like, we, we talked briefly about the one where, uh, you know, like Mike gets back in the ice cream truck with Reggie and they kind of drive off into the dark. And it's such just like, you know, the way that they incorporated these like audio clips of Mike like dying and he's like, I'm dying, oh, yeah. Reggie. And then like the way that then the characters in the old footage are like reacting to those, those like sounds that they're hearing and you just like. It, it works so perfectly. You almost think that they planned this whole thing, even though you know that's like n- not possible. Like, I found myself thinking that it was like, well, did ILM get involved? And yeah. like they replaced Grand Moff Tarkin's <laughs> yeah. face here? It's like- crazy. <laughs> but it's such a beautiful moment too, that, that whole thing. Yeah, that whole it's, a, it's amazing. I, so we're, as we're wrapping up our thoughts and I, I'm looking at the clock, are we, yeah, yeah, are yeah. we at a rating system type of moment? Here? Let's do it. All right. Well, how many tortoises crossing the highway would you give? <laughs> phantasm for oblivion uh i can start and i'm gonna give it five tortoises Mm. which is what the same that i gave three Mm -hmm. but just for very different reasons basically like because this one's really artsy and cool and dreamy like we've been talking about and you know opens up the mythology and and gives us a lot of uh clues and pieces and things that we're wondering about um but yeah like i said before as as a standalone movie narrative it's like almost nonsensical and in that uh way i did enjoy the little kid and rocky and all the balls of three <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and i think we'd be having a very different conversation if matt had only watched four. Oh my god <laughs> <laughs> uh i think i'm gonna give it seven i really i think it's i think it's the second my second favorite one to the first one i think that there's a lot of really wonderful stuff happening here it has you know some uh Reggie's encounter with the demon cop has some of the action that came from two and three. It kind of builds on the mythology. It builds on the story in a way that, you know, I don't think that you see until you start getting into, you know, soft reboots of series with aging stars from the eighties, like, you know, your, your Rocky Balboa's and your force awakens like this, this Mm -hmm. movie's and you, you made a boyhood joke, but like, (laughs) like that, that is happening in this movie in a way that's, up until this point, I think pretty unique in any sort of movie. Um, and that being, and, and also just watching it, I, I, I get that giddy. I want to make something type of feeling uh, that's really fun and uh, is contagious from, from all of these movies. Yeah. I think uh, I'm going to give this one a six up from the last movie. Uh, I think I was actually going to, sorry, six, six tortoises crossing the road. Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, yeah it was cumbersome. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was going to originally probably give it a five, but like, yeah, talking more with you guys, you know, 
I think when I was watching this movie too, I, I was feeling like, man, some of these scenes are really slow and like, I don't know, you know, everything's mm-hmm. so confusing. I mean, this is definitely a movie that like, like, like we said, like it's so far down the road into phantasm and everything. Like if you're not fully on board with the, with what's going on in these movies, like this movie's not for you. You're not going to just be like, no one's going to be like, Oh man, check out phantasm four. It's real fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it was, it just would be nonsensical to anyone who uh, hasn't gone down and watched all of them. Um, but that like the, the fact that it brings back and you guys were talking more about this and that was making me think that I like it better. The, the dreamlike qualities of the first one, that was something yeah. that we talked about uh, being really, really amazing and just kind of like kind of lulling you into this kind of atmosphere. And I think that it's really cool that it brings a lot of that back and just the, the, yeah, the use of the old footage from the first film is just really impressive um, and something that, yeah, we don't get to see to this extent, I think a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think just kind of like the bold choices and storytelling um, and ending just on a total cliffhanger again, like a total badass, like, Hey, we're just going to end on a cliffhanger. We don't know if there's going to be another movie, whatever. That's phantasm. So I love it. Um, so the rating scale for the tortoise is out of 10. It is out of 10, yeah. 10 tortoises. Yes. All right. So if I was to put, I kind of want to base it off of the first one. Yes. Um, so, and if I was to put like, I would put like Halloween and the exorcist at like 12. Yes. So um, I would put the first phantasm probably at nine. I mean, I loved it. It, 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 I get goosebumps in the independent film ways the same way I, the first time I watched blood simple or evil dead. Yeah. So I think it's just like a nine, if not a 10, this one, honestly, I, I think I, I think I put an eight just cause I get the same kind of independent goosebumps. Like it just feels like he went back to something and it's so rare to be able to go back to something like a lot of these, you know, iconic filmmakers, like once you go studio, that's kind of where maybe you're living um, outside of maybe the Coen brothers who have had final cut since I think day one. Yep. But you know, it's to get to be able to go back and do something um, a little esoteric and fun and go back to your roots. Uh, that's why I landed at an eight. But it brings up a question. So, as far as fourth films go in a franchise, where does this rank for you guys? As far as oh man, it's it's and pretty good be because pretty we've got the same actors, yeah. same director. Yeah, we're addressing things. Uh, we didn't retcon too much. We obviously lost Timmy, but um, you know he he's in the yeah. class. Uh, we've seen some real sequel crimes. Like, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, usually fourth movie is either a completely different series altogether, <laughs> or they're reintroducing original actors in some way where it's like it's their kid or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like I'm trying to think if there's one. Oh, is uh, is Tremors for the Western one? Yeah, that's yeah. so, so that, one, one. that yeah. one's great. That one's great. Um, that's unique. Yeah, I'm trying to think. A, a lot of them by the fourth is where the wheels have already flown off. <laughs> I I think it's, I know we brought up. Oh, sorry. Liz. I was going to say I know we brought up Chucky a bunch of times, but Bride yeah. of Chucky I think is four, and so yeah. that is another great kind of reset. Yeah, but that's yeah, true. go ahead. I think it's stronger than Elm Street 4, Dream Master, Rennie Harlan. Yep. I think, you know, Scream 4 is fun, but I think this one I kind of connect with just because of all the indie stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Halloween 4 was when they brought Michael Myers back because John wanted to do Season of the Witch. Right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it wasn't I remember good. that being fun, but I didn't have the same kind of reaction that I had to this. And so I would even like, I would even double down on that and be like, you know, does it sit with like Mad Max Fury Road, Rocky Four, yeah. Weapon Four, Harry Potter, Goblet right. of Fire. <laughs> we can talk about it. Is it Star Wars or is it Phantom Menace? That's the fourth. Depending yeah. on how you look yeah. at it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm following you on this. I, I, I completely agree. And interestingly, he turned down uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and Chucky 3. He was mm-hmm. offered to direct both. And he was like, I don't necessarily want to do sequels, but his... Uh, Phantasm kept bringing him back from when he actually had something to say about it. So I, I think that that is part of where the, I don't know, magic of these movies comes from. Yeah. And the way that it's the same people, but there is a huge amount of time between each one. Yeah. Too. That's very rare. Uh, they're usually all crammed together or spread apart so much that there's no one 
in common. Um, before we uh, try to predict what happens in the fifth one, uh, we need to talk about this song. Yes. Uh, so, Matt, uh, you, you missed the end credits, right? You, you didn't watch the I, very yeah. end? Yeah. It's a crime. You have we, definitely got to go back and listen. We, to we right always we always harp on Tyler for missing the end credits. There's always some sequence he misses. Yeah. I now I know. Yeah. I, well, t- well, typically I, I'm yeah. watching on a train into the office, and it's always just like, okay, I'm, the guy pad's done. Like, I go, go in. But uh, like, when I heard what was happening with this credit song, I literally put my hands up in the air and was like, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Matt. Uh, so for some reference for you, are you aware of the song? He's back. Uh, the man behind the mask by Alice Cooper. Yes. So <laughs> from Friday the 13th part six. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, it's a song about, uh, you know, Jason and it uses some music from the, uh, music from the score. This is like that same thing, except performed by Reggie Bannister himself. <laughs> Oh. Going under the name, listen to this. Going under the name, here's the name of his band Reggie B and the Jizz Whalen Ya Doggies. <laughs> playing Jizz, like figuring Dan in the Golden Nodes. Like, I know, I was like, what? Can you imagine? They, they mix Phantasm with the Cantina song. That would be like even more ultimate, like brain exploding. But I yeah. Get well, why Toscarelli was so inspired by Reggie. I mean, the dude is a legend. It's yeah. great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the song is called Have You Seen It? And uh, now we, yeah, we had asked you, Have You Heard It? So now you're going to have to go <laughs> go check it out. <laughs> are we are we going to close out the episode with that? I hope we oh, do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Although okay, it's, been, it's, been, yeah. it's been Phantasm score the entire time. The minute we have a song, we got to use it. <laughs> It's so good. It's uh, I was very very excited to see that. Um, all, all right. right. Well, bo- oh, Ravager. Go ahead. Yes, Ravager s- is five. It's got a V in it, so that works. <laughs> um, and how many years later is it? It's a lot it of years. Tw- it was twenty sixteen, so it was almost a decade. Wow. Okay. And we said what? He didn't direct it, but he wrote it. I believe so. Okay. Um, well, correct. I mean, maybe Jody's gone for good now. Reggie will definitely be there. That's oh, he has like, to be. Yeah. Um, have you all talked about Angus Scrim, aka Lawrence Rory Guy's Wikipedia page yet? No. You no. mean you mean Grammy winner uh, <laughs> Angus Scrim? <laughs> so I came across this in the research of diving deep into Phantasm, and on his Wikipedia page, his fictional character biography for the Tall Man. Have you seen this? No. no. Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll read it. Originally, the tall man was a mild mannered 19th century mortician by the name of Jebediah Morningside. After years of performing funerals and burying the bodies of those who had died, he began to develop a fascination with any possible connection between our world and the world of the dead. Okay. Jebediah's research eventually led him to construct a machine that enabled him to travel through time and space. After going through the portal for the first time, traveling to a destination unknown, he promptly returned, irrevocably changed, and henceforth known as the tall man. I feel like that should have been the trailer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty great. It's amazing. Uh, I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> he, and I love me some Angus Scrum. I mean, he he aged like a fine wine over 19 years watching these four movies. Absolutely. Yeah. So good. So good. <laughs> So for Ravager, I, I I mean, I hope Angus is still around for that. I imagine he has to be. Uh, they can always just use old footage. That's yeah, true. That's, that's true. So oh, man. The old footage for this. Uh, I, I don't have I have absolutely zero guesses what could be happening in this movie. I mean, maybe we'll find out more about if Mike is the tall man, was the tall man, will become the tall man. I don't know. <sighs> yeah. Someone gets ravaged, and hopefully it's not a sad, attractive girl in a motel room with Reggie. Yeah, will Reggie finally get laid? I really, if if yes, she better be age appropriate right? yeah. and consensual. consensual. Like, how old? If if he's in this movie, how old is he now? Like, yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah. If she's like, what is she age appropriate? Is uh, 
Like in her 70s? 60s, 60s, yeah, 70s, yeah, exactly. 70, yeah. Hey, that's a woman's sexual prime, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Reggie. All right. <laughs> so, Matt, thank you so much oh, for man, doing this. This is so much fun. In uh, no uh, way it, did yeah. I require you to watch all the movies. I literally <laughs> just said, all you have to do is watch this movie before you come on. And you oh. did the work. It's uh, I've been wanting to dive in and this gave me a reason and I'm so happy. Like literally you guys made my my Halloween month. So thanks for the invite. Oh, man. Uh, That's so awesome. And where can people uh, find you, follow you on the Internet? Uh, I'm I think I have a website still. Um, I'm also uh, with Tyler at ResetContent.com. Uh-huh. Um, I'm on the Instagram thing. Uh, Matt Beeler and uh, yeah, Visibles on Hulu um, on the Hulu YouTube page. And um, yeah, check it out. Hopefully you guys like it. It was Sweet. Fun Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much for being here, Matt. And uh, I know he said this towards the beginning of the movie, but, you know, finally. The final day, I'll be dead. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week for Phantasm Ravager. Yeah.